Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. You are tuned into black and white photography today. So we're going to be doing some post processing uh, for black and white images. And this is part three of our three part series with the wonderful Capture One and Alex Lopez. Alex, welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Doing wonderful. How about yourself? Great. Looking forward to this. We are looking forward to it, too. You've knocked it out of the park with the first two parts. <laughs> we talked about some color theory and, and all things color. And today we are diving into black and white. I want to send a huge welcome to those of you joining us on the BNH event space YouTube page and our main BNH Facebook page. And before we get started here, I just want to share my screen because we do have a deal going on. For those of you who have not tried out Capture One, 179 right there, an instant savings of $120. That offer ends on July 11th, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, Alex, I'm going to kick it over to you if you guys do have any questions at all on either the Capture One products or color grading, any post-processing at all. Alex is going to help you out with that. Alex, I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Eric. Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here once again. Um, wrapping up this series, uh, this three-part series about color theory, as Derek said, we've talked about color these past two sessions, and now finally it's time for black and white, which I'm very excited about because I actually love uh, black and white photography. Uh, it's a passion that goes back to when I started shooting film. I didn't used to do a lot of um, black and white post-production digitally until I didn't start shooting uh, film because that's what kind of gave me um, some ideas on how things could look like and how things um, would be like a little bit more natural and not so clean. Uh, what I didn't like about doing uh, black and white photography, digital photography in black and white, is that it kind of looked too sharp, too clean. So um, the tips I'm going to give you today are yeah, kind of about making it not so sharp, not so clean, uh, not so perfect. Uh, black and white, um, sorry, digital photography. Uh, offers us a lot these days in terms of quality, um, resolution, and things like that. And of course, we don't want to get rid of the resolution, but we want to get rid of this kind of look of things being too nice or too perfect. Um, well, that's what I want, at least today. So to do that, we're going to see three different styles on how to edit in black and white. Uh, all three of them kind of come from this um, analog background. So the first one we're going to do is a bleach bypass. Um, so the bleach bypass um, aesthetics, it comes actually from um, the movie processing. So when movies were shot on film, uh, there was different processes to develop that film and to bring that film to life. And the bleach bypass was invented. It's, it's, uh, it is like, well, actually, you're skipping one of the baths, which is the bleach. Uh, that's why it's called bleach bypass, obviously. And skipping that step on the process has different consequences, uh, which somebody thought they were nice. And I agree with that. So the consequences of that is uh, we're going to get, get um, an image that's going to be very high contrast. It's going to have very deep um, shadows and very deep blacks. It's going to be desaturated and it's also going to have some extra grain. Um, in case you don't really know what I'm talking about, uh, this is a very popular aesthetic in some movies, like some really cult movies like Seven or Saving Private Ryan. They use this kind of process and this is where it comes from. Well, technically, this is a color only process. But if you take these uh, characteristics and you apply them to black and white, you can also get a uh, very nice thing. So it's kind of inspired by that. So this is where we're going to start today. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And let's get started. So I prepare here some different photos. So this is the three styles that we'll be showing today. So this is a bleach bypass inspired one. Um, and then we have also these two, which, as you can see, are very different from each other. So this is where we're going to start, actually. This photo, we used it also for the, I think the first, it was the first part of the of the color series. And the reason why I kept it here and I decided to use the same photo was coming back. I'm just going to put it full screen so that you're not distracted by all the noise in the interface. So the reason why I use this one and that the reason why I wanted to bring the color version up in the beginning, it's because it all comes back to how we started in the first session saying, so why are we doing this and how, why do we want to work with the color tools and what do we want to achieve, right? And then the importance of visualizing, visualizing what you want to tell and understanding how color can help you with that. So obviously this is two very different aesthetics for the same image. So on the left, we have color and we have uh, like a very uh, pastel soft color uh, that is also kind of 
swift into the greens in the shadows, like you can see over here that is kind of green slash cyan. Um, it's also like a very filmsy look, uh, even though it's not quite there, but it's it's kind of inspired by that. And it's much, the, the look on the model's face is much softer. Uh, it tells a whole different story. If you compare it to this one, um, even though the photo is exactly the same and this expression on the face is exactly the same, what you can tell is that the expression actually kind of changes. And it's not because it actually changes, it's because the contrast changes and the light changes and that produces some changes and it changes how we perceive this person. So I thought it was interesting to kick it off with this comparison. And then once that I made my point, we can move on to version two. So this is what we're going to be doing. I already did this. I wanted to show you where I want to get before I completely restart the photo. Remember, if you're not familiar with Capture One, that all the adjustments you do in Capture One are completely non-destructive and you can always go back to what you used to have your raw file. So let's do that. So to do that over here on the top left corner, clicking on reset, and that's going to bring up my bring back my raw file. Uh, the first thing that I did was actually to crop it. I think that's a good starting point, actually. So let's do that. Uh, I need to change my aspect ratio. I'm going to use a 4 per 5. That's really my go-to for this kind of environmental portraits. Uh, I don't know, especially for this kind of editorial style shots. Uh, it, 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 I like this format actually because it's like the mag the classical magazine format for per five. So I don't know, it, it, I, it actually, I think it works. Okay, so that's our crop. And now we can start with the black and white. Um, first of all, um, disclaimer, this is not like, a this is more like about the editing styles. And if you're not familiar with the tools in Capture One, if you miss the other two parts of the series, which you can rewatch actually, uh, the links are on the chat. This is not about how to use the tools per se. So don't worry if you don't follow 100% of the tools that I'll be uh, using today. Actually, it's going to be a very minimal editing with very, very few tools. But in case that you don't get some of them, we will have future sessions. We have past sessions and we will have future sessions explaining uh, specific tools. Uh, take it easy today and just follow the process and you can rewatch it at any time as well. Okay, let's go ahead, let's get started. So over here on the left, we have the tool tabs in Capture One and on the adjust is where we will be spending most of the time because this is where we can find not only the color and the exposure tools, but also the black and white. So the first thing that we need to do in Capture One when we want to do a black and white edit is go over here to the black and white tool and click on enable black and white. So once we do that, the picture goes black and white and these filters uh, get activated. And this also comes from the origins of photography actually when you would just put a filter in front of your lens uh, to get different effects and different contrasts. So this is actually the same thing. Let's just pick a very noticeable tone like blue on this picture. So by controlling these sliders, you can see that you can also control contrast. And this is where I like to start when I do black and white edits, even though I'm going to be working later on in the contrast through a different tool, which is going to be full curves today, actually. Um, but I, this, is, this is where I like to start uh, working with my contrast, with the color filters. So let's reset it and let's start from the beginning. So I like to start with the red. Uh, when you use the red and the yellow sliders, keep in mind that if you're uh, editing a portrait, this is where the skin tone is going to be mostly. And so that's going to have a very dramatic effect. If we go over to the right and we make it very bright, are we going to have a lot of texture on the skin disappear? So if we go a little bit closer and then I show you before and after. So this is before, this is after. Uh, it gives a whole different look. It can be nice to soften the skin, but on the other hand, it can be kind of artificial looking, so I'm not going to take it that far, actually. What I'm going to do is actually going to take it the other way, because I want to create contrast between the skin and the sweater, so that's going to be in between the cyan and the blue. So I'm going to put it up, and I'm just going to try to work with these masses, uh, these color masses, that what used to be color masses, I'm just going to work with that and try to see it as spaces that can interact between each other. And then on the yellow, I'm, I'm going to put it up, in fact. So actually, by using these two sliders, you can get very nice uh, skin effects. I don't think there's much going on on the green and not much going on on the magenta, just a little bit on the lips and on the hair. So I'm going to put it up to give it a little bit more light and a little bit more of a shine on the lips. 
Okay, so that's like the starting point. And now we take it from here. Uh, just another thing I forgot to mention is that the black and white tool is not compatible with layers. It's one of the few tools in Capture One that is not compatible with layers. So keep that in mind. If you go to a new layer and you try to apply this tool, you're not going to make it work. Uh, it's going to be grayed out and you, will, you won't be able to use it. So always use it on the background. But now that we have done that, I'm actually going to create a different layer. So if you follow the two parts of the, the previous parts of the series, uh, I explained why I like to do all my editing in layers, which is because I'm going to create a new fill adjustment layer. That's a layer with a mask that covers everything in the image, which is what we want. And the reason why I like to do this is because if I take it too far, wherever direction I go, I can always go back and change opacity easily without the need to go into the actual curve and redo the whole thing again. And maybe this... Uh, adjustments is interacting with other adjustments that are on top of each other and then I don't really know what's what anymore. Um, so that used to happen to me a lot and this is why I started using the layers because if I go too far, go down on the opacity and you're good to go. And this layer is going to be for my curves. I'm actually going to use the Luma curve um, because this picture used to be an RGB picture. It's still going to have a different effect if we use the RGB curve or the Luma curve. When I do black and white, I always prefer to use my Luma curve because that's my guarantee that it's not going to be interacting with color in any way. It's just going to interact with um, lightness and contrast, which is exactly what I want. So how do we get this bleach bypass kind of look with a lot of contrast and very deep blacks and very deep shadows? So we're going to create a very aggressive S-shaped curve. If you're not comfortable with curves, if you're not familiar with them, you could possibly get a very similar look by using the level. So kind of just playing around with the with these dots on the bottom, like this represents black, this represents white, and by playing around with this one here, which is for the mid-tones, you could get a similar effect, but still I would do it on the curves because that gives me much more control. And for this kind of look, we need to be very specific of where we are creating the contrast. We need to uh, understand that uh, some detail in the shadows is going to go away, but that's fine because we're not doing this for scientific accuracy. We're just doing this because we want to have like a nice funky look. Okay, so that's a very contrasted curve. Uh, that's a good starting point, I, I think. It's very aggressive though. So you can see that actually there is almost no detail here on the blacks. I'm not too concerned about that anyways. I would be concerned if there was not detail on the face, for example, but this is just hair. So it's also fine that we don't have detail everywhere. Still, it's maybe a little bit too much. So let's play around with that. Also, uh, when you use curves, if you go, you, you, need, you can go up and down, but then you can also go left and right. So if I bring these two points closer together, that means that we're, I will be created creating most of the contrast is going to be on the mid-tones actually, which can be something interesting to play around with. So, okay, I'm happy with my highlights over here and I'm happy with my, um, with my curve over here. If we feel at any point that we are missing too much detail, we can always go to the high dynamic range tool and kind of recompensate and open up the shadows a little bit. But I think that kind of ruins the point in this case, so I will not be doing that maybe just a little bit higher up. Okay, great. So this is where I want to go. Then I think that's a good starting point. Um, the next thing that I want to do is I want to work a little bit more on my contrast, but on the mid-tone. So um, kind of on everything that's happening here in the background, on the face especially, and this part over here. So what I'm going to do to increase the contrast in the mid-tones is I'm going to use clarity. That's what clarity is, actually. Some, some people uh, think of clarity like as a kind of contrast, and it actually is. So it is just contrast, but focused on the mid-tone area. So kind of leaving out the shadows and the highlights and just creating contrast in those, in, in those areas in the middle of the histogram. So I'm going to separate this from my curves in case I need to recalibrate something. So I'm going to start by creating again another new fill adjustment layer. This one's going to be for clarity, and I'm going to give it a very dramatic clarity adjustment. So something over there, and you can feel how things are starting to change a little bit. So I think I really like this look. It's very, it's kind of aggressive. It's very powerful. 
and those deep shadows and with the contrast with the highlights i think i think it's very interesting something else that i would like to do here so i apply my clarity it takes the whole photo that's great but it could be if you are if we are applying this sort of adjustment to portraits if we go a little bit closer that has a con which is it's going to be creating a lot of this uh, mid-tone contrast in the face on the skin and that it's not that isn't always the best idea for portraits because it can highlight some of the defects on the skin so what i'm going to do uh, because i want to keep the rest of the contrast and the mid-tone contrast in the image but i want to get rid of it a little bit just on the face what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh by the way the shortcut for showing the mask is m so now you know so what I'm going to do is in my layer panel, I'm going to grab the eraser and I'm going to use this eraser to get rid of a little bit of this mask. So in order to do that gradually, I'm going to right click. The size and the hardness is fine. Possibly I'm going to pick a little bit of a lower hardness and a little bit smaller. And what I'm going to do also is I'm going to take a look at the flow. So the flow is basically how many times you need to brush in order for the adjustment to take place. Or in this case with the eraser, how many times you have to erase so that the mask will start uh, erasing. So it's going to be very gradually. Uh, so now if I start brushing out, you can see the mask starting to disappear a little bit. I'm going to deactivate the uh, showing mask. So pressing M again, that brings me back to my whole photo. And that's actually what I want to do because I want to make sure uh, how the effect that I'm applying is working on the actual photo not on how the mask is showing. So if I turn the layer on and off, so now it's off, now it's on, I think that's working great. So I think it gives it a little bit more of an extra punch. And that would be like the black and white. And of course, there is something very important that is missing here, which is film grain. Uh, when I said before that I didn't used to like doing black and white edits on digital photography, it's also because I didn't really know the film grain tools to its full extent. And that actually really changed for me when I discovered Capture One. So the film grain tools is not in the adjustments tab, it's on the refine tab, which is the one on the right. And this is where we can find um, all things detail, like sharpening, noise reduction, um, mare, and things like that. And of course, we, we can also find here film grain. If you would prefer to have it somewhere else in your interface, like floating around or putting on another tab, you can always do that. The interface in Capture One is completely customizable. For now, I'm just going to put it where it was. There we go. OK, so in order to activate the film grain, we just need to work on the impact or, or choose one of the different sizes of grain. So one of the things I like about grain in Capture One is that there is not only like opacity and size, there is different types of grain, uh, different shapes of grain that you can play around with. And some of these, like the Silver Ridge, is actually very interesting because it it is it feels really filmsy to me. So this is probably not somewhere where you can see grain, but let's get a little bit closer and let's see. Yeah, we can find it here. So it's nice to take a part where we have highlights, midtones, and shadows to see how the grain affects each one of them, possibly a little bit not so big. Okay, that's great. So I actually really like this silver rich film, uh, film grain. And the reason why I chose a silver rich in this sense is because we are kind of emulating, as I said, this bleach bypass applied to black and white photography. And what actually happens in the bleach bypass process and the reason why it has that effect of like the high contrast and more grain and things like that, it's because you are step, you're skipping that part of the process and that makes the, the silver salts are staying on the film. Uh, it, it, creates, it, it creates that effect because there is more silver on the film, actually. So this is actually why I like to use a silver rich uh, film grain here, because I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, even if you don't really know, if you have seen Saving Private Ryan or any sort of, of movie that you can relate to that aesthetics and you see this, maybe you don't know why, but it relates. And some when it comes to editing, I think it's very important that you do things that make sense for your brain uh, in, 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 in a sense. I think that we talked all about this as well on the first session. So there we go. That's our film grain. Let's go back. If we wanted to have it a little bit more a little bit bigger, we can work on the granularity. So the gra gra granularity, oh my God, what with that word? So the granularity, it's actually the size of the grain and the impact is going to be the opacity of it. So I always prefer to have a lower opacity and a bigger grain. So it's visible, but not overwhelming. So this is where I'd like it to stay. 
And another good thing that we can do is that we can save our own film grain presets. So if I wanted to save this one, like say, for example, save custom preset just for the grain, that's not going to take any of the things that I um, applied on the photo. I could save it as a style if I wanted to, but for now, I'm just going to save the grain. So I'm going to save this grain and I'm going to call it bleach bypass. So the next time I want to do a bleach bypass um, editing, I already have my grain saved. Okay, that's great. So that's the first of three styles. So let's move on to the next one if there are any questions, which I can see there aren't so far. So this is the second photo that I prepared for today. As you can see, if we compare two very different looks, um, very different aesthetics, uh, very different, the things that it implies. For this one, I chose a wedding photo uh, from one of our ambassadors, Eric Ronald. So thanks for um, sharing with us so that we can teach people how to use Capture One. So on this one here, I chose a raw, uh, this raw file from a wedding because I think it ties it very nicely. It's a kind of romantic look. Um, this kind of look, it's called, like, I don't know if it's uh, officially called that way, but I, it's, I just call it washed out because it's, it's a completely opposite aesthetics. It's like, instead of having very dark um, shadows and very deep blacks and very contrasted whites, we have all the opposite. Uh, we have, we don't really have black, and we don't really have white. So we have all the mid-tones and we have very, very soft shadows. We have very soft highlights and everything's everything's kind of in the same zones of gray. I really like this look. I think it ties in very nicely for wedding photography, for portraits in general, and for any kind of photo that you want to have a nostalgic look on. So, and actually the washed out way to call it or expression it, it also comes from um the analog times and for the from the chemistry lab times um not really sure what it what is the part that is skipped but it's also something that you could control in the lab back in the days so i also like to recreate this kind of lab processes in capture one because it as i said it ties back to reality and i think it's nice to not have something so abstract to, to have kind of something to hold on to so i'll shut up about the introduction and i'll get started with the editing so here we kind of follow the same process. We follow the same tools. So you're going to see it gets very consistent. So again, starting on the top left corner, resetting the adjustments and going back. So this is the original photo, of course, in color. And again, the first thing that we need to do is go make sure that we are in the background, black and white tool and enable. So this is where we're going to start. So again, let's start by playing around with the filters. Uh, something to keep in mind here. Actually, let me disable the black and white just for a second. Just take a look at the skin tones here. So their skin tones are kind of dark. So if we go all the way up to the reds, we can end up with a completely different skin tone that doesn't tie back to reality. And I don't think this bride and groom would possibly be very happy about that, that they don't recognize themselves in the photos. So bear that in mind when you are doing uh, black and white conversions um, in with portraits to make sure that even if we play around with the contrast and with the red and the yellow filters, just make sure that the skin is staying within a range of luminosity that has something to do with the actual person that's being portrayed. So in this case, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm going to bring it actually a little bit down and I'm going to try to create the contrast uh, between the skin and the, um, and the suit. Again, I'm gonna kind of doing the same thing. So kind of putting down, pulling down the reds and up with the yellows, something around there. Let's see what else we have here. Again, not so much on the green, on the cyan. Yeah, this is where things are starting to happen. So this is where I want to start pulling things up a little bit. And on the magenta, yeah, we have the makeup and we have part of her hair and part of the lips. So all the way up. Okay, so again, this is a starting point. And now, how do we make sure that we get to this washed out look that we wanted to achieve. So again, I'm going to be using the curves because again, it's the thing that gives you the most control. But again, you could also do it in levels if you wanted to. So what I'm going to be doing in the curves, the first thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be, uh, again, with the Luma curve, I'm going just to take the dot that represents black and I'm going to put it up a little bit. If we put it too much up, that's going to be a little bit too much. So just a little bit as a starting point. And then I'm going to fine tune this adjustment with different tools that I'm going to be showing you in a second. 
And again, with the white, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So what you are doing by doing this, if you take a look at the histogram, is you are compressing the histogram. There's no black, there's no white, there's only the things in between. And I think that's fantastic if that's what we want to achieve. So something around there that's a starting point, of course, it doesn't need to, the, the, the fact that there is no black and white, that doesn't mean that it needs to be a super flat picture. So we can still work with our curve to create a little bit more of contrast, but by making sure that we are not going too far with the, um, with the black especially. So the fact, the, the reason why I did this and I lifted up the black point is that it can never be black if that point is not all the way down here. So that's gonna be super helpful for us to achieve this kind of look. Okay, so I think that's working great. And again, what I'm going to do here is I want to get rid of some of the detail. I want to get rid of some of this perfection that we find in, in digital photography, uh, just so that it can be relatable to the analog times and to create this kind of nostalgic look. So ah, I, skipped, I skipped doing the extra layer for the curve, actually, but that's not a problem because I just discovered the other way, the other day, something really nice uh, for the moments that I was wrong uh, when doing my workflow. So if I just add the new fill adjustment layer now and I right click on it, you can apply the adjustments from, it should be here. I'm not sure, maybe I'm not in the right version. Maybe it's in my other computer. Yeah, forget about that. There is an option that <laughs> you can apply the adjustments from the background. So sorry about that. I thought I could do that, but I think I don't think I can yet. Okay, just this is what happens when you try out all the betas and and all the betas and all the all the random versions. Sometimes these things happen. So apologize for that. So it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to keep the curve on the background, and I'm going to be doing the next layer for the clarity. So what I want to be doing now is creating the field adjustment layer as I did before. It's also going to be for clarity, but it's going to be the opposite again from the, what we did the, on the last picture. So going down to my clarity adjustments, and in this case, I'm gonna reduce clarity massively. So that's gonna get rid of a lot of this perfection, a lot of, de a lot of these detail. I really like the effect that it has on the background and on the clothes. Again, clarity can be tricky when it comes to skins because if I take the clarity too much down, then they kind of become like an oil painting and that's kind of a weird look for the skin. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pay attention to the background and to the other details on the photo. And I'm gonna decide this is where I like the rest of the photo, even though uh, the skin is way too soft. So I'm going to do the opposite um, adjustment again. So checking on the clarity and again, brushing out some of these part. So you can see that the mask starts to uh, become a little bit more transparent. And now just back to my photo and I'm going to debrush it only where I don't need it. So on the skin tone, maybe a little bit on the hair. And let's take a look at the before and after of the clarity. So this is before, this is after. Possibly we need to get a little bit back of the detail on the eyes, just like so. So this is before. This is after, I think that's looking better. If we went a little bit too far in debrushing the adjustments, we can always bring them back on. Just make sure again that your flow is very low and just like random brushes here. Yeah, you end up with a very random mask, but one that works. And I think that's what's most important really. So this is where we are now, um, but there is something else that I would actually like to do here, which is using the color balance tool. Um, the color balance tool is one of my favorites as you saw probably on the previous part of the series. I'm not going to be using this one for color right now. I'm just gonna be using this slide over here. So on the sh on each of the wheels actually, you have one, uh, you have the wheel for choosing the tint. On the left, you have a saturation control for that tint that you selected. And on the right, there's a third slider, which we don't typically tend to use. I would never use the mid-tones or the highlights possibly but I do often work with the one in the shadows because if I lift it up just a little bit like that, it's going to have this, this kind of extra creamy look, uh, this super soft look that I wanna achieve here. And the reason why I do this uh, by mixing the curves and this adjustment is because the way it affects the photo. 
So the curves affect the raw file in a very deep way. So kind of like under the hood, while the color balance kind of acts as a filter. So even though you have the contrast there, you're kind of applying a thing on the top to make it less contrasted. And I think it's a different effect. And in this case, I really like how these two things play out together. So this is uh, how I would like to, to do it here. Okay, so now I'm going to, again, work on my film grain. So going back to refine, and again, I could choose one of these or any kind of grain. Uh, let's, if you don't really know what you want to achieve, you can start by putting in a random impact on any kind of grain and then switch between them and just see how they play out. So the soft grain could be nice. Cubic grain, the tabular grain I really like because as I said before, it's, it's big, but it's not so impactful. So this is possibly where I want to be working with. So I'm going to keep this granularity and I'm going to take out the impact a little bit. So something maybe a little bit bigger. So something that is like soft, but it still give it some texture. It's actually super important to use this film grain uh, when you're going for this kind of decontrasted, washed out look, because it kind of fills in um, what should have been filled before with contrast and the different kind of textures. So we are getting rid of the contrast. We're getting rid of the textures. So we are we better add something else on top of that to uh, make it a little bit more interesting. And this is where the film grain plays really nicely. So again, I could save it as a preset. So I'm, why not? I'm just going to do that because I can. So washed out. Okay, so that's it. Uh, this is also, by the way, a super popular look, both in black and white and color. This is a really, really popular look nowadays in in TV series. Uh, if you have watched, for example, House of the Dragon, they go so much for this kind of look. So if you watch House of the Dragon, you see that there is actually no black. There is actually no pure black in the whole series, or well, at least on the, on the first season. There's no black at all. This is also the look that Marvel movies go for. It's super popular these days. It's like basically... Uh, the fashion, the fashionable thing to do in TV series. Not criticizing that at all. I actually really like it, as I said. But just be aware. And if you are looking out for some ideas on how to improve your editing, whether it is black and white or color, I recommend you take a look, a look at some of these series because the color, work, the color work in all of them is fantastic. Okay, so that's number two. That's like the washout look or look number two for today. So let's now go for look number three. So for look number three, I'm gonna use this picture. Uh, it's street photography. Uh, it's actually not my photo. This is also from one of my friends, Alexander Lemus. So thank you for that. Um, and for this picture, it's kind of, you could say a mix between both. Like the three looks are heavily inspired by film photography. But in this one, I just wanted to go for a more um, tinted um, kind of film. So when you scan film or you reproduce film, it's very weird that it's actually always pure black and white with no color information whatsoever because all the films have tints on it. Uh, if you take, if you compare to negatives or to films uh, with the, from different brands or from different models, you're going to see like the film strip has a different color and it can be drastically different. So that creates this always on sort of tint on the on the film. And whenever I'm doing black and white edits on digital photography, I tend to tint it if very, very subtly because I don't want to have like that pure black and white look because that looks very digital to me. So this is where I went, what I went for. In this case, I went with the color balance, uh, also with a color balance tool. You can see that I apply the same adjustment. Um, and then I also tinted the shadows slightly and the highlights. But before we get to that, again, let's reset the picture and let's start from the beginning. So this is the original. Now we go, we are on our background, we enable black and white and same thing as before, we start playing around. So in this case, if we want to have some sort of difference between the skin tone and the wall in the background, the background we probably want to get the reds up a little bit. In this case, it's not concerning me so much with the skin texture and so on, because even though this is a photo of a person it's not really a portrait though so we don't have that much texture on the skin uh we don't have much detail on the skin simply because it's further away and it doesn't take as much space on the photo so we're gonna go up on the on the red and the yellows i really like how 
Working with the yellows, you can get a little bit of extra light on the background. Over the green, there's never anything on the green. Obviously, if this was a landscape, there would be a lot of things going on on the green. Then on the cyan blue side of things, let's just play around with these. Okay, so I actually like, what do I like here? Let's play around. Yeah, I actually like uh, to have a little bit more light on the suit again, because otherwise it can get a little bit more confused with the wall on the background. And also with this uh, little pillar here with texture, I think it looks better this way. And on the magenta side of things, we just have this little um, air vent on the background. So just going to put it up a little bit. Okay, so again, that's our basic editing uh, in black and white. That's our basic contrast. And this time I will not forget going to create a new field adjustment layer and this is where my curves are going to happen okay so all the way back to the curves again using the limit curve to make sure that i'm not uh unintentionally tampering color the color that lies within the black and white because don't forget this is non destructive this is just data on top of a preview so this picture is not actually black and white until you don't process it this is still an, an rgb a perfectly valid rgb file uh, just we are seeing it black and white because we activate it to see it that way. But it doesn't turn it actually into black and white. This is why we can go back to the color version of it. So again, let's do something kind of in between. Let's do like this S-shaped curve, but let's lift it from here also a little bit. And that starts to take shape. I don't think that we need to do a lot of things with the white here. If I wanted to have a little bit more contrast, uh, in this case, because we're already working with the curves like so, if we want if, like an easy way to have a little bit of an extra contrast or a little bit more luminosity in any photo uh, after you've applied curves and brightness and things like that, but still you're lacking this kind of like spark of light, it's very useful for me to go with the levels and just draw, grab the white point and bring it up just a little bit like that. So as you can see, if I show you the before and after of this adjustment, so this is before, this is after, it's just giving it that extra contrast, that extra shine that this picture needs, I think. So I think that's a very good way to achieve it. Um, again, to make sure that it's not so perfect, I'm going to be taking down some of the clarity. In this case, I'm going to do it in the same picture as I'm not so concerned what's going to happen with the skin texture. But yeah, just kind of ruining it, ruining, it, ruining the details a little bit. Uh, let's play around with the highlights and the shadows as well. There's not much going on on the highlights. We could bring the shadows back a little bit, but I don't think that's a good idea. Because, you know, in the end of the day, this is like an alley and we want to make it look mysterious or something like that. So I think it's nice that the background is a little bit more dark. And then because we did this adjustment, we have a lot of extra light on the face and on the shirt, which also creates a nice contrast with the, with the, with the jacket. Okay, so this is where we are now. I still kind of feel that it's a little bit too perfect. So if you want to get rid of detail and saturation in the same time, saturation doesn't really make a lot of sense here, uh, but you could also apply this to uh, color edits. If you feel that it's still too perfect, that's still too sharp, uh, you may want to go down to the dehaze tool and not go positive because that would be for removing haze. What we want to do here is actually add haze just a little bit. If we go too far, it will create like a very decontrasted look, which may mean that we need to recalibrate some of the adjustments a little bit. But I think that's nice. If we go closer again, we can see that there is not a lot of detail in this photo. And that's great. That's what I want because we don't have a lot of detail, but we're going to uh, we're going to put on top a very um, a very visible film grain. So that's going to fill in there like the rest of the um, gray spots, so to say. Something else that can always happen when we shoot film, when we shoot with old cameras and old lenses is vignettes. I love vignettes actually. And I think for this picture, it just goes perfect. So I'm just gonna apply a very, very simple vignette. I'm not gonna even bother to do a different layer. I'm just gonna use the vignette tool to keep things simple. And that also kind of give it some, some depth on the picture. So I really like that. Mm, possibly I wanna, I want to make it a little bit brighter, so just like 0.2 uh, on exposure. That's actually two tenths of a stop. So in case you didn't know that, fun fact, the exposure slider in Capture One, it ties in perfectly to how 
um, exposure works uh, when you work from the camera. So if I would give it plus one, that would be actually one extra stop. That would be exactly the same thing as opening up one stop on your camera. Fun fact, in case you didn't know, now you do. Okay, so that would be kind of like the contrast and the look, everything that we've done before. But the one thing that I wanted to do differently here, as I said, was to work with color tints. So I'm gonna add a new field adjustment layer just to make things separate. I'm gonna call it tints. And of course, going back to my color balance. It's just like, I'm kidding. I didn't, I don't really do this. I just like, I wanted to use this tool because I, I it cannot be one session that I don't use this tool. So I'm just using it because of that. No, I'm just kidding. I think it's great for black and white too, to use these color tools. It's not super intuitive. Like, I don't know if you would think of it, if you wouldn't see somebody else doing it. I didn't make it up myself. Obviously, I also saw someone else doing that. I don't really remember who, possibly David Grover. Uh, my colleague, which by the way, is going to be in the States for the next couple of weeks, doing some live streams on color with Paul, with our ambassador, Paul Reefer. So you may want to catch that on our YouTube channel. I think it's going to be super interesting. They're going to be um, doing some wildlife and nature shots. So you may want to check it out. While I was talking about this, what I'm doing is I'm choosing the tint on my shadows. I really like to go over to the cool side of things. Like you could also do, actually, I'm going to do two versions just to show you how different it can be and how it can really affect how your picture looks like. So I'm going to go for like a more blue cold thing on this version. And then on the highlights, I'm going to do a little bit more cyan slash green just to make sure that it all goes like together. I think that's nice. And the only thing that we are left to do with this one is to add the film grain again. So let's play around now and see what we have. So if we would choose a fine grain. Uh, for some reason, the fine grain doesn't let me change the granularity so that it stays fine, I guess. And here, I think this one is too soft. So let's go with some, something a little bit more aggressive. The tabular one, I really, really like the tabular ground, the hard grain. Hard grain I don't typically use because it's a little bit too much. But if we play around with that one a little bit, it can be nice. I think this is nice. Okay, so this is the cool version. Now again, uh, by working with color and working with color theory and the psychology of color, we can get to very different results just by changing one thing in this picture. So what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm going to duplicate this variant. So now I have two exact same versions of this. And instead of going over to the left side of the wheel with the cool, where the cool tones are, where the cool kids are, can you imagine? Um, let's go over to the other side of the wheel. So if we start working with yellow, with red even, with purple, some very interesting things start to happen. Purple is nice, but I think if you want to go for like a more vintage look, you may want to play around here between the red and the yellow on the orange side of things. And then possibly the highlights, just a little bit more yellow than orange. So now we have two different versions of exactly the same thing. And just by changing one slider in one tool, you can see that the difference is massive. So this is why this is my favorite tool in Capture One. So easy to use, so easy to be creative with it. And it lets you do so many different things. So this is the third look that I prepared for today. Um, I guess we can open up the floor now for questions and answers, if any. Yes, we will open it up for some Q&A. We already do have a question from Janelle joining us on YouTube asking, what would be the difference with editing the black and white with a monochrome sensor like a Leica monochrome? Okay, that's a super good question, actually. So the difference between using a monochrome camera with a monochrome sensor and using a normal camera and then converting it to black and white, it goes back to uh, what I said before, talking about the curves and why I use the Luma curve in this case instead of using the RGB curve. Um, what you're doing when you are capturing a photo with a normal camera is you are capturing three channels. You're capturing red, green, and blue. And the sum of these three channels is what makes the photo what it is. So when you activate the black and white in Capture One or any other photo editor, what you're doing is like you're, the software is just converting this information to luminosity information. Um, but the red, green, and blue channels are actually there under the hood. Um, so that's going to have a different effect. But when you shoot with a monochrome sensor, that's very interesting because 
it's not a red, green, and blue channel. It's just one sensor with one type of um, uh, receiver, which is a monochrome receiver. So that means that no color information is captured when you use that kind of camera. So that gives you a very, very, very crispy black and white look, very pure detail, uh, very nice edges. Um, and it may behave, it may behave differently actually when you tint it. Not sure about that part though. I would have to try it. It's been a while that I don't edit a monochrome file, but thanks for the question. Very interesting. Yes. And if you guys want to look more into that, I know Phil Penman, a buddy of mine, uh, like a monochrome shooter and also a Capture One user. I know he's been interviewed for the Capture One blog and the Capture One YouTube. So if you go over to the Capture One YouTube, I know there is a video of his post-processing. So if you guys are interested more in that, nice. you can look that up as well. Just a little information drop there. And we have another question from Garrison joining us here on Zoom. Garrison recommends the film Mank by David Fincher. So I haven't nice. checked that out, Garrison. I'm going to have to check that out as well. But says that is a very good, um, what he refers to as a black and white Bible. So I'll have to look into that. He has a couple questions here for you, Alex. Have you done or do you do cinematic photography, which is aiming for uh, photos that look like frames shot straight from a film? Yes, definitely. I like I like to do that a lot when I edit my pictures. Um well, actually, when I edit my pictures, I would typically either go for a very painting-like look or a very filmic-like look. Doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the photographic language, obviously, uh, but I think it's references that I get a lot from and I, that I got a lot from in my life. So um, even if I don't want to, I always end up going one of these ways. Um, so one of the things that for me was really key uh, for doing this kind of cinematic look was actually the cropping part, which is very overlooked, but you would never believe that this is part of a movie because this is not the movie aspect ratio. So if you would like this to be, to feel like it's a movie, you need to go for 16 per nine at least, or even a more panoramic one. So that can be more like it. So that's a very, a very, very not so obvious thing that gets overlooked quite a bit when you want to go for this kind of look. Definitely. And I feel like that's a big conversation with people is the color grading and having that more. And I think it, it lends itself to, it's so easy for people to say, oh, I hate the word cinematic and I hate this and that. But I think what we're really getting at is a lot of great visual techniques have come from the film world as far as lighting and just telling stories through imagery. A lot of that starts in these iconic films, whereas it's easier to refer to a film than it is a photo per se. It really is because we have this... Uh collective imagination where we reference all of these famous movies and all of these cult movies and also just think about this for a second how much money does it go into these productions like it is insane the amount of money that gets spent on on any sort of film even if it's a low budget film it's insane and the amount of money that's spent in post-processing is insane so obviously the, obviously these people are spending a lot of money to make these films and they know very well what they're doing so it looks expensive because it is. <laughs> Definitely. And we were talking in the green room, Alex, about New York City and the pros and cons. And I think that's a, a huge con of living in a place where a lot of films are shot is that you get exposed to these open film sets. You walking down the street so many times and you'll see a film set and yes. you get a, a secret sneak peek of, of how they're made and you know, you walk by and you'll see like a 30 or 40 foot scrim and you're like, how many photographers just have the the power or the the money or the budget to have some of the stuff that they have on film sets? So, yeah, I think budget plays into a lot where you can kind of do anything you want because you control the narrative, you control the lighting, you control every aspect of what you're looking at and you're not at the mercy of a smaller set or a smaller budget. Exactly. It's just like building it from the scratch. And, and like when you take a photo, you can also build it from the scratch. But many times we're just like, you know, passing by, seeing what's there and capturing it. So it's it, it's just two different things. But for the post-production processes where we actually can have more control than we would have in this kind of environment where we are shooting a wedding, um, why not use it? Definitely. And Garrison's follow-up question, who are your photography heroes, let alone movies, TV series that have influenced your work? Oh, my God. Uh, this is a question where like when someone asks, what's your favorite movie? And you are like, have I ever seen a movie in my life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. When you're on the spot, you can't think of it. Yeah. Uh, well, recently, I'm very, very interested. Uh, I really like Martin Parr. I really like the kitsch look and the super 
color contrast with super bright colors. It's just like, there is no middle term. I really like Martin Parr. And then I really like some gloomy photographers. Like there is a Spanish one that you may not know, but I, I would mention him and ask you to check it out. He's called Eugenio Recuenco. I can write it on the chat. Uh, but he's one of these photographers that creates everything from the scratch and everything in his sets are super thought thought about. And his photography is amazing. So co two completely different photographers, two completely different styles, but both amazing. It's always have, it's good to have more inspiration to look up to. And I, I'm in the same boat. And, you know, you can name a list of them when you don't need them. But the second someone asks, it's hard to to come up with that name. There it is. All right. I'm yeah. going to have to look him up. What do you prefer in your in your personal? I mean, we've seen you go through the color process and the black and white process. What do you prefer for your personal images? It really depends. It's two completely different languages. So sometimes you have this photo that it's like, okay, this obviously needs to be black and white because it couldn't be in any other way. Uh, but I do work a lot with color. Uh, I like to work with color in, I think, in a, in a very particular way. Uh, because of what I said before, like I take a lot of inspiration from movies and from paintings. So when I work with color, it always tends to go towards um, cold shadows, desaturated tones. Uh, I really like uh, the not so perfect, not so crisp look. Uh, same thing with black and white. Just like it really depends on the project and it really depends what I'm doing. Okay. And again, we've had you on for a series of three. This is going to sound like a softball question here, but I've heard it from numerous people in the industry that I work closely with that capture one is head and shoulders above beyond what else is out there. I've heard people who are like, look, I've used everything. And then when I used capture one, it was eye opening and it was life changing for the post processing. What is it about capture one that's so different or what makes it stand out to photographers that have used every post processing software? So I think, I think it's all about the color profiles. It's like a really simple answer, but sometimes a simple answer is the right one. And the fact that all the cameras are profiled ad hoc, it's incredible because when you think about it, you have this raw file and it's not really an image. It's just a bunch of data. So the way the software that you use to read this data interacts with that, with the final look of the image is unbelievable. Like the first time I opened up my files and capture one, I was using another software before. And the first time I did that, I was like, I had no idea that a software can have such an effect. I, I just thought like was something like, well, yeah, you have to do this because it's digital and what to do, like we are stuck with this thing. But it's actually when I discovered that, that things could look great also in digital photography, when I started using Capture One, I was not happy with digital photography at all. I was like this dark room rat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is what has such an effect. And obviously the tools are well built, it's stable, it works how it's supposed to work which is something that may sound very obvious, but not so many things in life work as they are supposed to. Mm -hmm. So when you find something that does, it's like, oh yeah, it, it works, you know? Yeah, and I've always been the kind, of, like I'm not a pixel peeper. I don't get too deep. I love post-processing, but you know, I'm grateful for the people out there who do look at those things because I think it's the people who really nitpick and look at the details and are really, really, really adamant about every little nuance um, making a difference in their photography or in their post-processing because people like me just kind of gloss over and it's like, all right, whatever, I'll, I'll use whatever is out there. Um, but I, I've heard, you know, like I shoot Fujifilm. So for Fujifilm, I've heard, well, Capture One is it. You have to. Nobody nobody treats the image files and, and you don't think of this idea that you would think all software would handle files the same. And it doesn't until you get into a, a program and see the difference. It's hard because it was hard for me for a long time to grasp that one program over the other it's like okay it's the same file why does the software matter about i'm just it's all the same sliders right it is a massive difference uh, actually like even the way the sliders work if if you would apply the same value in one software and the other it would have a, diff a completely different impact so for example the contrast lighter in capture one is it's like a really fine one uh it's a really subtle thing uh but it's really fine that it only it, it it has a nice balance between how it affects contrast and how it affects color, right? Because, and it also gives you a lot of control because if you want to have like a balance between affecting those two things that normally go hand in hand, you would use a contrast lighter. If you want to just affect color, you would use the RGB channels. Or if you just want to uh, affect luminosity, then you would use the luma curve. But if you just want to keep things simple, the contrast lighter works great. It, it really does. Uh, because in other softwares, if you apply a lot of contrast, you're going to get 
you're going to start to get some weird colors, especially like the warm colors, like uh, orange, yellow, red, particularly. They're going to get saturated. They're going to get weird. Uh, that doesn't happen with the contrast light ring capture one. So it's all about these tiny details that make the difference. And obviously, if you work with Fujifilm, it's, it's, I think it's the only software where you can have the film simulations. And the fact that you can use the color science from Fuji, which is amazing uh, because of their experience in working with film precisely, the fact that you can have all of that in a software. And sometimes when I shoot Fuji, it's just like I apply a film simulation, some contrast, and that's it, I'm done. I because those simulations it. are great. The colors are amazing. Totally. I was looking at the one image, the, the portrait you shot, and I was looking at it, I was like, that looks like, was that shot on Fujifilm? Was that a GFX That's shot, That's shot on Fujifilm GFX, yeah. I was going to say. It looked like GFX, maybe the classic Neg film simulation. I don't know. I could be wrong. I think you are right, actually. That's classic see, negative. See how good yeah, I am right you're, now. You're good at this. Huh? Was it? Hey, there we go. <laughs> Score one for the event space team. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think I need to bottle up your description of that because... When you get off into the weeds with editing, I can't tell you how many times it's like, okay, start on the sliders because they're easy. Next thing you know, the sliders are leaving something off. Something's not right, but I don't know what it is. So then I go to curves and then you start playing around. It's like, okay, get a little more control, but it's also easier to make, you know, the slightest little move in curves throws can throw things way off. I think that's where the sliders are easier, but you make yeah. me want to dive in more. And it's like, you start to question yourself, which is better sliders or curves, or do I go into you know, use a little bit of both, but regardless. It's not better or worse, really. Like, it all depends how much control you want to get. If you mm -hmm. feel comfortable with having control, then you may want to do curves. Uh, if you just want to do a quick edit or you don't really know how curves work, that's totally legit. It took me years to really learn how curves work. And even though today I still, I'm like, oh, I didn't know I could do this with curves. So it's really a process with curves. It's like a never ending process. So mm -hmm. more control is more responsibility. So, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So this sort of thing. So if you don't want to have that great responsibility, stick with li with sliders and they are great as well. Yeah, go out there, have fun with the people, move the sliders all the way up, all the way down, go into the curves, move them all around, see what you get from it. I think that's the easiest way yeah. to learn is to see what it does. If you, you know, you put a an anchor point here and drag it up and then you- put And when you, when you mess here. something up and you don't know where things are coming from, where it's like, so when, what did I do when things started to go wrong? And then it makes you go back step by step. And then yeah. you see, oh, this was actually what was causing a weird issue that I didn't know about. So there you go. It, it, you learn so much just by playing around and you're going to get terrible edits, but you're going to learn a lot. It sounds like me, terrible edits. Well, <laughs> our final question here, Alex, I don't know if there is any written materials available, but Chris is a, someone who, who processes things that are in writing better than this visual stuff. Is there anywhere that any of this is in writing or any blog posts that are about this or any place you can direct us? There are a lot of blog posts in our blog in Capture One, in the Capture One Learning Hub. There is tons of resources and materials about different tools. Uh, so that would be like the, the go-to place. And then uh, I used to write a Capture One blog, but it's in Spanish. I haven't updated it in like two years, but it's. I remember that I used to do uh, some materials about color, uh, the color editor and the color balance. So not sure if you speak Spanish or not, but if you do, you can also check it out. There we go. Special bonus for our Spanish speaking viewers out there. <laughs> Alex, always great having you on and a huge thank you to color, uh, color one, capture one. You got me all in the, the color thing now, black and white one too. Capture one has been a wonderful host for this series. And to all of our viewers out there, no matter where you're watching, we thank you guys for always tuning in and getting your questions in. That's all we got for now, though. Another edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space is in the books. Catch y'all next time.